My name is David Spencer and you're listening to Talk Radio. The Duke of Edinburgh was the man who walked two paces behind the Queen for most of his life, the quiet rock on which the monarchy leant for all those years. The Duke of Edinburgh was born Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark in Corfu in the summer of 1921. He was the nephew of the king. In 1922, the Greco-Turkish War ended badly for Greece. The king and his brother were blamed. With his life in danger, Prince Andrew fled, taking his family with him, including Prince Philip, who was 18 months old. They settled in Paris. The young prince attended a preparatory school in Berkshire and then a school in Murray near Inverness. In 1939, he joined the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth, where he graduated as the best cadet of his team. Prince Philip rose to the rank of commander and served throughout the Second World War. Handwritten logbook notes from 1941 revealed his innermost thoughts during a battle against the Italian Navy off the coast of Greece. The fleet steaming east again in the future is still in the dark. Remembering the torpedo howling attack which we witnessed on Crete, anti-aircraft action stations were closed up just before sunset. Reconnaissance aircraft had found three Italian cruisers steaming eastwards in the neighbourhood of Crete. The enemy's shooting was getting rather too accurate. Prince Philip was aboard HMS Welp in 1945 and saw the Japanese surrender firsthand. Being in Tokyo Bay with the surrender ceremony taking place in a battleship which was, what, 200 yards away, and you could see what was going on with a pair of binoculars. It was a great relief. And I remember because from there we went on to Hong Kong. And the most extraordinary sensation when we sailed, we suddenly realized we didn't have to darken ship anymore. We didn't have to close all the scuttles. We didn't have to turn the lights out. So you suddenly, all these little things built up to, to uh, you suddenly feeling that life was different. Less than two years after the Second World War had ended, Philip Mountbatten's engagement to Princess Elizabeth was announced to the world. Just four months later, in November 1947, they married at Westminster Abbey. That morning, Philip had been granted the title Duke of Edinburgh. Hi, Philip. Hi, Philip. Take thee, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary. Take thee, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary. To my wedded wife. To my wedded wife. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. You're listening to Talk Radio. Following news that the Duke of Edinburgh has passed away, this special programme looks back at his life. A year into their marriage, the Duke of Edinburgh and Princess Elizabeth had a son, Prince Charles, and not long afterwards, a daughter, Princess Anne. Less than five years after making his wedding vows, the Duke of Edinburgh's wife became the Queen. George VI's death in 1952 changed the course of the young couple's life. Royal author Roya Nikar explains that prior to that, Prince Philip seemed to be heading in only one direction. The Duke of Edinburgh was a very, very successful and prolific man in the Royal Navy. You know, he was mentioned in dispatches for his service in the Battle of Matapan. And he was on the rise, you know, as a very accomplished naval officer. And the Duke of Edinburgh had very much, you know, a career path that was ahead of him and he would have gone as many people thought he would have gone right to the top of the Royal Navy um, had he his career been allowed to continue and flourish but of course that didn't happen and um, you know George VI died much sooner than people thought and Philip had to give up his career which was an enormous part of his life and a very important part of his life and that was a very difficult thing for him to do this was someone who was really accomplished in his military career the Duke was seen by many as an outsider and some were resistant to his influence on the monarchy. He became a moderniser of the royal family. He redecorated Clarence House, where he and Her Majesty lived. And it was the Duke of Edinburgh who pushed for the Queen's coronation in 1953 to be televised to allow millions across the world 
and importantly across the Commonwealth to watch her formally assume the throne. Lips' creativity was evident again in 1992, as Roya Nakar explains. When Windsor Castle had that terrible fire, he was absolutely at the core of um, rebuilding Windsor, but also the designs for it. The um, private chapel at Windsor Castle that was rebuilt, he designed, um, had a hand in the in design, not only of the chapel, but of the stained glass window that went in there. And very famously, the designs include the firefighters, you know, grappling with the hoses to, to put the fire out. And that was his idea. And Prince Philip, you know, there was a Prince Philip prize for design. You know, he he championed design. He was interested in it. But he did all of these things very quietly behind the scenes. You know, Prince Philip was not one to crave or expect public recognition. Other members of the royal family we know set their stall by how much publicity they get. The Duke of Edinburgh never did. He did things very quietly behind the scenes. You're listening to a special programme as Talk Radio, together with The Times, looks back on the life of Prince Philip following news that he's passed away. The Duke of Edinburgh was a lover of the great outdoors. A keen sportsman, cricket and polo were his favourites. He was still active in his later years, telling the Associated Press at Windsor in 2017 about his determination to pursue new interests. I decided that I would give up polo when I was 50. I happened to be 50. And I was looking around to see what, what next, you know. I don't know what there was available. And uh, I suddenly thought, well, we've got horses and carriages and grooms. I said, well, why don't I have a go? So I borrowed four horses from the stables in London, took them to Norfolk and practised and, and you know, thought, well, why not? <laughs> and the, the second competition I ever took part in was the European Championships here. <laughs> I, I came in not quite last, but very nearly. <laughs> in 1956, Prince Philip's love for the outdoors and his concern for young people growing up in post-war Britain combined, and he founded the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. Since then, more than six million youngsters around the world have taken part, and the scheme is still going strong today. It's great to know that so many people are taking up the, the award and getting some uh, pleasure and, and encouragement from it. Uh, it always seems pretty awful at the time, but you, it's like all the things that you do, it's wonderful when you stop doing them. <laughs> and so when you've got your gold award, you can bask in it for the rest of your lives. Prince Philip's love of nature led him to be a vocal conservationist too, and in this area he was decades ahead of his time. The human impact on our planet has become a key issue now, but in 1987 it wasn't quite the same. There are a number of different reasons why we should be concerned about the, the conservation of nature and the natural system. Uh, there, there's an economic reason, there's a scientific reason, there's a self-interest reason. But there should also be a moral reason, it seemed to me. If you go on expanding uh, uh, economic, industrial activity, if you go on expanding the human population, I mean, uh, it's, it's something's got to happen sooner or later, but I have no idea when it's going to happen. The fact is that we're on a, on a very serious decline. I mean, there's a degradation of the environment is, is evident. You're listening to Talk Radio. Following news of his death, it's impossible to reflect on Prince Philip's life without discussing his extensive public service. He was patron or president of more than 700 charities or organisations, and for many years his annual diary contained more than 200 engagements. It was only at the age of 96 that he finally retired from public duties, having carried out more than 22,000 of them from 1952 onwards. He was determined to make sure everyone he spoke to enjoyed meeting him, using his quick wit to prompt a laugh. I'd like to say how very delighted I am to be here this evening. Uh, I can say that in all consciousness because I didn't know I was going to be given a cheque for 5000 for turning up. <laughs> but attempting to draw smiles also brought danger. Some comments landed him in hot water and were seen as politically incorrect gaffes. It became something that defined him, and despite repeated examples, he refused to change, revealing a certain stubbornness of character. Some felt a car crash in 2019 was further evidence of that trait. It occurred as he drove alone at the age of 97. Alongside stubbornness was self-sacrifice. 
Having given up his military career for his wife, he took a back seat to help her fulfil the role of Queen, as his friend Martin Palmer once told the BBC. Putting it very simply, he wore the trousers within the household in order that she could wear the crown for the people. And I, that really was important to him, that he was there to support her. He ran the family, ran the sort of family business side of things. Um, and that was the first priority, so that she could be Queen. His concern and love for his family was pronounced particularly during the difficulties between Prince Charles and Princess Diana. It was 15 years before extracts emerged from private letters written between the Duke of Edinburgh and his daughter-in-law. Dearest Pa, I was so pleased to receive your letter, and particularly so to read that you are desperately anxious to help. I can only repeat what I have said before. If invited, I will always do my utmost to help you and Charles to the best of my ability but I am quite ready to concede that I have no talent as a marriage counsellor. Dearest Pa, I was particularly touched by your most recent letter, which proved to me, if I did not already know it, that you really do care. You are very modest about your marriage guidance skills, and I disagree with you. Any guidance the Duke of Edinburgh ever gave was drawn from decades of experience. His marriage to Queen Elizabeth began in 1947. As they celebrated their golden wedding anniversary in 1997, he shared some of it. I think that the main lesson that we've learned is that tolerance is the one essential ingredient of any happy marriage. It may not be quite so important when things are going well, but it is absolutely vital when things get difficult. And uh, you can take it from me that the Queen has the quality of tolerance and abundance. <laughs> Prince Philip's was a life that spoke of deep and committed relationships, with his marriage the greatest example. The man who had given up his naval career to love Elizabeth made good on his promise to do so unwaveringly, content to be an unsung hero of a long and glorious reign. As we digest the news that he's died, we'll leave the final word to the person most able to describe him, the Queen herself. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know.